This video has been classified as M. It is recommended for people aged 15 years and over. This program contains content that may distress some viewers. This is what running for your life looks like in Gaza. An ambulance with a young girl and wounded woman inside, rocked by explosions as they attempt to flee. Hello, I'm Paul Barry. Welcome to Media Watch. And with the death toll in Gaza now more than 2,600, many of whom are women and children, nearly one million people have fled their homes. And while Israeli bombs continue to flatten the city, rescuers and families dig into the rubble looking for survivors. And Gaza-based reporters bravely carry on. When I drove this morning... That sounds like it was quite close okay. to you, Rushdie. Rushdie, can you hear me? Are you OK? Al Jazeera reporter Maram Hamid is filing a daily diary amid the bombardment, which on day four was headlined. Today in Gaza, I no longer believe we'll get out of Israel's assault alive. But initially, we saw little protests from the Western media. Or US President Joe Biden, who is right behind Israel, offering weapons and support, and was quick to condemn the Hamas terrorists who provoked the attacks by murdering 1,400 Israelis, many of whom were women and children too. This is an act of sheer evil. These bloodthirstiness brings to mind the worst, the worst rampages of ISIS. The Australian media also condemned Hamas after its brutal attacks and rallied to Israel's side, with News Corp leading the pack. Gates of hell. Vengeance is coming. Israel's 9-11. Unbearable cruelty of terror savages. The latest round of bloodletting in this long-running conflict began nine days ago when armed Hamas terrorists crossed the border from Gaza and swarmed across southern Israel, killing as they went. 260 young people were slaughtered at a music festival in the desert, hunted down as they tried to flee. And in villages near the Gaza border, even worse scenes confronted rescuers. But once the Israeli army regained control, it made sure these horrors were shown to the world, with busloads of journalists taken to Kafarazar kibbutz, where more than 100 people had died to be met with scenes of carnage and stories from soldiers of Hamas atrocities, recounted here by two reporters from Israel's I-24 TV News. It will be extremely difficult for me to describe the horror, the apocalypse. Babies, their heads cut off, that's what they said. Gunned down, families completely gunned down in their beds. That horrific baby claim went viral on social media, with 44 million views on X in just 24 hours. And it made headlines in Australia. Monsters cut heads off babies. But was it true? Palestinian supporters on social media swore it was cruel propaganda and baseless lies used to justify all-out war. But Joe Biden said he had seen the proof. I never really thought that I would see and have confirmed pictures of terrorists beheading children. Only for his aides to admit a few hours later he hadn't actually seen the photos. Next, the story was confirmed by Israel. The Israeli Prime Minister's spokesman just confirmed babies and toddlers were found with their heads decapitated in Kafar Aza. Only for that claim to be contradicted too, with an unnamed Israeli official admitting they had no evidence to back it up. And why did it matter so much when babies clearly had been murdered by Hamas and the Israeli foreign ministry now posted pictures of charred corpses? Well, decapitating babies spoke of even greater depravity. And as Amin Abbas, CEO of a Palestinian children's charity, pointed out in an email to MediaWatch, Unverified and lurid claims about Palestinian atrocities can themselves be used to justify counter-atrocities and campaigns of ethnic cleansing. But while the beheadings were unverified, plenty more was not, and Hamas had clearly committed war crimes. At another kibbutz, three k's from the Gaza border, the Hamas attack was captured on CCTV and filmed on body cam as gunmen roamed from house to house 
and rounded up young and old before shooting them dead. And in the aftermath, the story from shocked reporters was much the same. People were shot and killed in their beds, executed at point-blank range. This is the most horrific thing I have ever seen. But you didn't need to be there to see it. It was all on social media, with a Palestinian journalist, Muthena Al-Najjar, giving a running commentary as gunshots and killing went on around him. Videos of several attacks were posted to social media by Hamas or its supporters and republished by the mainstream media, mostly without the killings and the bodies. But on X, with Elon Musk in charge, little or nothing was left to the imagination. And the EU raised the threat of hefty fines, even as X claimed it had taken down hundreds of Hamas-linked accounts. Social media was also awash with misinformation, as BBC fact-checkers have shown. This video, viewed millions of times in the first two days of war, is not a rocket attack on Gaza. It's fireworks and football fans in Algiers. And this video of children in cages, posted by the leader of the far-right Britain First Party and viewed two million times, does not show Israeli kids taken hostage by Hamas, yet many in the Australian media were convinced it did. We've got kids in cages, these people. Hamas, kids in cages. Just appalling. I've seen pictures of children in cages, babies in cages, separated from their mums. I've seen videos of Jewish children who have been kidnapped from their homes and are now sitting in cages. But misinformation aside, and there was plenty more, no one could defend what Hamas fighters had done, which included taking hostages whose lives are now at risk. So, even when Palestinian opponents of Hamas were interviewed, they were required to condemn the terrorists before arguing that Israel was killing children too. The ABC's Hamish MacDonald twice asked Mustafa Bogutti, who is committed to non-violence. Do you, do, you, do you condemn the tactics that have been used by Hamas over the past I condemn, 40 years? I condemn, I, condemn, I condemn any violation of the rights of human beings anywhere. And next day on 7.30, Sarah Ferguson also pushed Bogutti hard. I've yet to see you categorically condemn Hamas's savage actions. And when she didn't get the answer she wanted, Ferguson continued. But I would like your human response. Let me give you the names of some children that have been taken hostage into Gaza. Five-year-old Raz Asher and his three-year-old sister, 12-year-old Irez and brother Sahar Calderon. One former TV news director contacted Media Watch to complain. In my view, Ferguson tried to perpetuate the ridiculous notion that all Palestinians are murderous terrorists. Personally, I don't think she was doing that. But in any case, Barghouti levelled the score by asking Ferguson in return... Do you want me to name to you the 140 children who were killed in Gaza by Israeli airstrikes? Meanwhile, on the BBC, Newsnight host Kirsty Walk was pursuing a similar line, with Hussam Zumlot, head of the Palestinian mission to the UK, who had just seen seven members of his extended family killed by Israeli bombs. I'm sorry for your own personal loss. I mean, can I just be clear, though, you cannot condone the killing of civilians in Israel, can you, nor the killing no, of families? No, we don't condone, and we are very clear. But as the week wore on, the plight of civilians in Gaza became more obvious and more desperate, as the ABC's John Lyons reported. Just in terms of Gaza's situation as it currently is, I think it's basically a humanitarian crisis already. The Israeli army in the last uh, week has dropped 6,000 bombs on the Gaza Strip. Now, just to get a sense of that perspective, imagine cutting Canberra in half, putting 2.3 million people into half of it, and then dropping 6,000 bombs on it. That's Gaza at the moment. And by the weekend, the media was more willing to see the pain inflicted by and on both sides. But not so much at News Corp, where the centre spread in the weekend Australian was headed, Israel must destroy Hamas to survive, while columnist Jared Baker was arguing on its website on Friday. Nobody wishes to see innocent lives lost, but the Jewish state has the right to respond as aggressively as it sees fit. As aggressively as it sees fit, despite the innocent civilians in the way. As MSNBC's Mehdi Hassan observed two days into the crisis... What the past 48 hours or so has revealed is that there are a lot of people who mourn for dead Israeli civilians but not dead Palestinian ones. And a lot of people who mourn for dead Palestinian civilians but not dead Israeli ones. What has happened to our collective humanity? What indeed? 
But now, to the voice referendum and the triumph of no over yes. Australia, Australia votes, votes no. no. Australia, Australia says no. no. A hard no. no. Needing a majority in four of the six states, the result on Saturday night never came close. And when the ABC's Anthony Green declared lights out in South Australia, the contest was over. So there it is. Anthony Green has called it at 7.24pm. The Indigenous Voice referendum has been defeated. And on 7, political editor Mark Riley was pinpointing the only positive for yes. This, this tiny little island that here, which we've got in grey at the moment, is the ACT, the People's Republic of the ACT, which is the only red spot in Australia at the moment. So that is just a black wall of doom. And with a Sandra Bullock rom-com, ironically called The Proposal, bearing down on the network for a 7.30 start, seven farewelled viewers like this. That is the story right across the country. Yep. No. All right, Mark, thank you for that. Obviously, we're going to stay with full analysis for the evening. Where will the referendum, uh, the detail? Not pretty, but nor was the night for the Yes Camp, although that was no surprise. The opinion polls predicted defeat for months, with the final news poll on Saturday showing the no vote 20 points ahead. In an effort to turn that around, the age ran this plea on its Friday front page. And they did vote yes in Melbourne's inner city seats. But regional areas and more than 60% of voters in Queensland, WA and South Australia delivered a big win for the No campaign and their media backers. Like News Corp's Peter Credlin and Andrew Bolt, who beamed into Sky's referendum coverage to say... I think this is a brilliant day for Australia, absolutely brilliant. We've uh, defeated an attempt to divide us by race in our constitution. And the tension with colleague Chris Kenny, who used his media platforms to champion a yes vote, was clear to see. I just think it's uh, very, very divisive to describe a measure that is designed to bring the nation together and to give Indigenous people a say on their own affairs as racially divisive. The lots of arguments, there are lots of arguments, it is Andrew, a against the voice parliament that in do not say it's for racially an Aboriginal divisive. Sovereignty in fact, movement. I know my good friend Anthony Dillon Mate, here I don't interrupt does you not when believe you're making points. I'd be very glad divisive. if you didn't interrupt me, right? OK. And on SBS, there was a boil over between leading yes and no campaigners. Uh, that you a have 20 said, percent hang on, Warren, of, we've got, you we're are, letting Marcia speak the here. You've had your turn. caused division in this country. I, we're about uniting this country and, and moving uh, forward uh, Warren, and fixing the problems that we have I'm in Aboriginal communities. just going to interrupt you there because... You know, I'm not going to sit here and cop lies well, from well, people. Well, we're not going to sit here and, and take you abusing uh, a, a nation national treasure like Marcia Langton, who never said that Australians were racist. Warren Mundine called it the worst interview he'd faced in the entire Voice campaign. Meanwhile, SBS host John Paul Jenke was highlighting the fear campaign by those opposed to The Voice, telling insiders... And misinformation played a big part in this. I think we can't estimate that. The feedback that we were getting from Western Sydney was that, you know, the fear of, I'm going to lose my house. If The Voice gets up, I'm going to lose my house. It's giving them extra rights that I don't have. And that really played a part. In the wake of defeat, the NT News used its Sunday front page to ask the most important question of all, what now? A question the PM tried to answer the night before in a speech widely praised by the media. We intend as a government to continue to do what we can to close the gap, to do what we can to advance reconciliation, to do what we can to listen to the First Australians. Thanks very much. And for the sake of the nation, let's hope the media ensures the no vote isn't seen as a vote for continued Indigenous disadvantage. And finally, to the defamation courts and a big slapdown for the ABC and one of its star reporters, Mark Willisey. ABC loses defamation case brought by former commando Heston Russell after public interest defence fails. Sad to say, it's a loss that we predicted and a case that we believe the ABC could never have defended. Heston Russell is a former Special Operations Commando who sued the ABC and investigative reporters Mark Willisey and Josh Robertson over two articles that claimed Russell's November platoon executed an unarmed prisoner in mid-2012. That allegation, as you may recall, relied entirely on one ex-US Marine who did not want to be identified for fear of retribution, but was happy to go on camera using a pseudonym, Josh. And you just heard a silence, and then we heard a pop, and then they said, OK, we have six prisoners. Um, and so it was pretty apparent to everybody involved in that mission that they had just killed a prisoner, that we had just watched them, like, catch and hogtie. 
As we said nearly two years ago, Josh was the ABC's sole witness to the killing, and he had not actually seen it happen. And that was always the difficulty with this story, with Justice Michael Lee taking only six weeks to reach a verdict that dismissed the ABC's defence and awarded Russell $390,000 in damages, which was naturally welcomed on the steps of the court by the former commando. Today the federal court decided that it was not in the public interest for the commandos of November platoon to be accused of heinous war crimes without any basis. The evidence at trial demonstrates that the publications that I sued over were concocted at best by the so-called investigative, investigative journalist unit of the ABC. It's fair to say the ABC's handling of the case was a disaster from day one. First of all, the broadcaster was forced to abandon its truth defence in May after Justice Lee struck most of it out. That left it relying on a new and untested public interest defence. But then, in a bizarre twist, the ABC abandoned that defence at the 11th hour over concerns it would identify its sole witness, only to backflip days later and reinstate it. In the end, Justice Lee gave the ABC short shrift, finding it had no reasonable belief that its stories were in the public interest and that it had not asked questions it should have asked or given Russell a right of reply, and adding... There may be several reasons why this dispute resulted in expensive and protracted litigation, but one of them was the existence of a defensive mindset inhibiting a proper remedial response to criticism. A mindset which may have caused the ABC to reject an offer to settle the case for $99,000 last year. But that's not to say Heston Russell emerged unscathed, with Justice Lee dismissing his case for aggravated damages and finding... Mr Russell was generally not an impressive witness. He was regularly non-responsive and was unwilling to make concessions he regarded as contrary to his case. All in all, I do not consider it safe to place any reliance upon his evidence. But either way, this is a black day for ABC News and its investigations unit. When we first tackled this story nearly two years ago, we argued that the ABC should have had more than one source to back up its allegation and should have asked more questions before publishing. But the ABC dismissed our criticism and Mark Willisey complained that we had got it wrong. As Justice Lee noted... Criticism was perceived as undermining the defence of ABC investigations to external attack. This may be understandable from a human perspective, but one suspect it was not conducive to considering dispassionately whether corrections and retractions needed to be made. More recently, we predicted the ABC's legal defence, which has cost more than half a million dollars, would fail badly. And while we said we hoped we were wrong, unfortunately for the ABC, we were not. That's all from us for tonight. Don't forget Media Bytes on Facebook, YouTube and Instagram. But for now, until next week, goodbye.